Hi, everyone. Welcome to another session of All Access. And uh, there's so much to cover this week. I think we had a great start to the new year and a bit of a rocky start with uh, the crypto space as uh, the price is going up and down a tiny bit. And I have a little bit of uh, to say about that because it impinges on, on how techies view the world. And um, uh, then, then I want to cover a whole bunch of other topics related to Avalanche. So let's get to it. Um, there's much to, to talk about, much to share. So um, let me uh, create an infinity well for you guys. And uh, there we go. So, uh, okay. So what do I want to start out talking about? Well, uh, the big thing, at least from my perspective right now, that I'm hearing from a bunch of circles are rotations. Traders love rotations. And um, and uh, they uh, they love to just sort of uh, go in, uh, you know, go go. They believe fundamentally that that assets must necessarily rest after uh, after rising in price a little bit. So that just means that they, there's a self reinforcing loop. And um, I've been thinking about this for a very long time, and it's kind of interesting how the markets play out. That is, there are uh, there are systems that are sort of that you can build. And then there are consensus um, uh, engines that form around them. So even in the, in the case of blockchains, these consensus engines have other uh, groups of uh, people uh, creating a, an opinion around them that can be self-reinforcing. If enough people believe something, then, then the underlying reality comes to reflect it. And it's kind of interesting. And, uh, and one of these uh, pernicious beliefs is, is that, uh, that you must rotate through, through assets. And traders believe this deeply. Traders believe a lot of other wrong things, and uh, they're very skittish as well, especially uh, at a time like this when um, uh, when the market takes a small downturn because of some comments from the Fed and because of what the institutions are doing. Then suddenly you have uh, everybody getting kind of panicky. First of all, I guess the main message that I have for especially the start of a new year is to observe the fact that we've made it. Crypto is here to stay. Crypto is a new asset class. I would not be saying this two and a half years ago. I would not be saying this three years ago. I wouldn't be saying this a few years ago at all. In fact, back then it was very, very unclear what crypto was. Was it some crappy little thing below the level of, uh, of um, uh, penny stocks? It wasn't clear. It was maybe, it was trash. It was just, it wasn't clear where it was going to head for most people. But now it's clear to everyone that there's utility here. Normies believe this as well. I think you and I probably could see this even back then, of course. But, but normal people are now beginning to recognize, hey, this thing does what Wall Street does much better. And this thing has utility. There is a reason why people are burning millions of dollars on avalanche in fees. That's not happening because, you know, people have money to burn. It's definitely not happening because somebody is, is burning, you know, whatever, just for the sake of activity. That's not at all what's going on. There's organic need for the services offered on this, this platform. And this is also true for Ethereum. Ethereum is seeing organic usage. Those high fees are happening there. So it's, uh, and, uh, it's, it's, it's a really exciting time. And uh, we've made it through, I think, the big hump of technological acceptance. The, uh, there will always be naysayers. There will be people who form their opinion early. They've, there will be people who form their opinion when Bitcoin was the only game in town. And uh, there will be people who form their opinion looking at only a subsection of the crypto space, listening to only a subset of the loudest narratives. And those people will, may, may well be naysayers. And that's okay. It's fine to have some haters for, for any new emerging technology. There were people saying the internet's not going to be that big. There were people saying in jest, perhaps, saying that it's not going to be as big as the fax machine. And, um, and I think any techie could see that this was a different kind of a, that was a different kind of a revolution. And I think this, the savvy uh, people now can see that uh, blockchains are here to stay. So that's great. And uh, we need to have confidence in our technology. Traders don't necessarily interact with the tech. So they get skittish very easily. They don't understand the differences between the different platforms. And um, the cyclic rotation thing comes from there. They get, they get antsy uh, anytime good things happen. I think it's part of the sort of the Judeo-Christian mentality that, you know, good things can't happen all the time. That, that if you have a couple of good things in a row, then, then it must be followed by something bad. And um, it's the gambler's fallacy, right? If, um, you know, if you're at the roulette wheel and things have happened one way, uh, then people believe things should happen the other way. No, it's it's the next move is is independent of the past history. So um, 
As for uh, rotations, um, so the, the issue is, okay, so you want to rotate. You want to go between, you know, uh, chains in the same equivalence class, just so that uh, the activity doesn't happen around the same stuff, isn't clustered around the same small set of coins. Fine. And then the next problem is there are so few credible contenders. There are lots of people making noise. I've mentioned this many times. Lots of people who sound kind of similar, but if you look at what's happening underneath, you find that there are some utterly unusable L1s that are now being propped up as, hey, this is like something that we could rotate into. And this is going to rub a lot of the techies the wrong way. And I want to talk a little bit about this. So first of all, I think one of the things that, uh, that we need to observe is in the long term, these things fix themselves, right? You can't just be selling a coin based on hopes and dreams and vapors of like something good to come, right? It's just not, that's not sustainable. I mean, you could probably last a few years like this, you know, your whatever thing is in the future that's to come, you could drag it out for a long, long time without delivering it. But at some point, the world has to face the reality that whatever is supposed to come is just not arriving anytime soon. So this whole thing um, just, uh, just essentially reminded me of, of, a very, of a very good play, a favorite play of mine. So one of my favorite plays is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, but uh, the precursor to that play, uh, the intellectual forefather, is Waiting for Godot. So there are lots of L1s, there are lots of systems out there that promise something. And that promise is going to be delivered at some indefinite date in the future. Or sometimes it's a definite date in the future that's constantly moving away. You know, kind of like, you know, uh, my dreams when I was uh, when I was a teenager, right? It's just, it's just you want to do stuff, but it's just it's so hard to get there. And as you move forward in life, the dreams are always a little further ahead. So, um, so we're going to see a lot of this, uh, especially uh, in fact we see them. It's like the pattern is this: yes, you know, your L1 name doesn't do some essential thing. It doesn't support smart contracts yet. It doesn't stay up for a week. It doesn't have reliable RPCs. The people who use it are all confused and they come away saying, hey, what happened to my transactions? I don't understand. I had to submit the same thing 15 times, etc." But they say some future release will fix all that. And that future release typically has a fancy name, right? And, uh, and so this is exactly like waiting for Godot. So in this play, there are two guys, uh, Vladimir and Estragon, and they spend the whole time talking to each other and it's it's and they, there's there's this one thing they're looking forward to. They're looking forward to the arrival of Godot. Who is Godot? We don't know. What do we know about Godot? His arrival will fix every problem. What are his features? He's just great, just great. But what are his specific features? No one knows. So it's a very strange thing, and. Uh, People who peddle hopes and dreams like this, they're constantly giving people the hope of something that's amazing and yet to come, and they constantly badmouth existing technology. The problem with existing technology is it exists, and people can then pick a, pick a fault with it. And the, the nice feature of something that hasn't arrived yet, that doesn't exist, is it's, it's got tabula rasa. It's got this completely blank play, slate. It's, it's got no nothing that anyone can pick on because nobody has... Has actually built it yet. It's just you know how I'm gonna I'm promise you motherhood and apple pie. You're gonna pick a bone with apple motherhood and apple pie. No, so these people are promising Godot, and um, uh, the funny thing in the play, of course, is every day uh, a messenger arrives, and uh, and the messenger says Godot will not be arriving that day. The messenger's name is Lucky, and uh, I did not put this in the in the uh, in the tweet thread, but uh, uh, every day he has an explanation. And the explanation is just gobbledygook. He just comes up and says a bunch of things. And poor Vlad and uh, and uh, Estragon, they never understand what the heck the what the heck Lucky is saying. You know, he's just saying blah 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 blah. It makes no sense. It might just be crypto gibberish, right? And uh, there's like lots of fancy words in there, lots and lots of amazing complicated things. Bottom line is Godot is not arriving. Okay, those people who manage to not build Godot are not going to be able to, uh, you know, for, until now, for whatever reason, that reason hasn't been addressed yet. They're not going to be able to build Godot in the future, most likely, because the, the, the core problem hasn't been addressed. So another narrative that we hear is, well, okay, this, uh, this system has low quality tech now, 
Um, uh, but thanks to the money that they raised, they will be able to buy the tech that they need. So this is a topic I've given a lot of thought to. I think a lot of you uh, who are in, in, you know, spent time in developing countries have given some thought to this. Um, why can't certain groups of people make faster progress than others? Like what's holding them back? Uh, why are some countries that are behind, why can't they just leapfrog the fast ones, right? Why can't they skip a generation of technology? Uh, why do they have to recommit the same mistakes as, uh, as the ones that, that already are, are slightly ahead of them? And, um, and I don't know the answers to this, but this is a persistent pattern. If you haven't addressed the core problem, if you haven't really been able to absorb a tech, if you don't understand and if you don't have the, the, the human resources who understand that tech deeply, who can, who can cater to its, its whatever it is, who understand its flaws and strengths, then, then you can't really go into the next step and you certainly cannot skip a generation of text into the next, next thing. And um, so if, if a team is lacking the expertise, the, the drive, the creativity, the internal culture required to deliver something, it probably is not going to be able to buy the creativity, the drive, the, the internal culture to, to, to deliver that thing. It's just hard. It's, it's not just hard, it's impossible. Um, but then to think that such a team could just identify, even identify the right technology is kind of absurd to me, let alone acquire it and absorb it. Like how, how many times have you seen a weak company acquire a better company? That's not how it works. So Godot, who is not arriving, is also not for sale. So, and this is a funny riddle that I saw when I was looking for images. What's always on its way but never arrives? Tomorrow. It's always tomorrow. So, uh, so these trader rotations are just pure momentum plays. We're going to see a bunch of these in a, in a sideways market, in a bear market. You're going to see some momentum plays and, uh, and, and you know, people's attention will, will shift back and forth. Um, now, these momentum plays are, are essentially identical to all the other meme coins. There's no difference between Dogecoin, Shiba coin, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and, a, uh, and a shift into low quality L1 because all your tra trader friends are buying that L1. So, um, so what's the right thing to do? You should just treat it as if it's a meme coin play. So what does that mean? We have to time it. So you have to time your entry, you have to time your exit. Now. Many of you who are listening to this actually have jobs and probably don't have the time, the inclination to, to do this. You need to be, you know, essentially so intertwined with the Gen Zers who are doing the meme coin thing, with the traders who are doing the, the tr trader cyclic rotations to really ride this. More than likely, you'll ride some of them well and come out ahead and you'll, you'll end up losing money on some other rotations. This is what typically happens to these people. It's on the net a very difficult game to play well. So if you don't want to do this, um, then I don't know what to say other than what I do, which is uh, to go with the tech. So if you don't want to monitor your investments, if you don't want to be up on your meme coin game or trader rotation game, um, you want to just sit back and focus on whatever it is that you do do well, um, then, uh, then the thing to do is to go with, the, with, with where the tech is. Now you can say, how do you identify the, the, the projects with the good tech? I've mentioned this many times before, it's things like innovation, team, uh, number of good ideas behind the projects, number of technologies that the team is, has mastered, uh, number of advances that they have made to the space. Uh, so these are all things that, that matter, uh, but there are also some very simple ones when it comes to platforms, right? Does the platform work? That's really question number one. Does it halt on a weekly basis? Does it reorg its blockchain on a daily basis? Does it do things people want and does it do them today? Or is it just a bunch of dreams for tomorrow? Is it a waiting for Godot scenario? So that's a really simple question to, to ask. Or you could ask the converse question, you know, go into the communities and say, hey, you know, what, what, what's, what's exciting? And if they say, you know, blah, -de blah, and where blah, -de blah is something that doesn't exist yet, then you are in a waiting for Godot narrative. So it could be anything, right? Taproot was the big thing when Bitcoiners waited for it. And, you know, it is what it is now. Um, Lightning Network, you know, et cetera. And I pick on these just because they're very famous, very well known. But, uh, but there are many, many others like this. I'm not going to name them by name. And uh, it's just uh, if, if, if a system is waiting for Godot, it's in a different tier than the systems that deliver. 
So you should treat it accordingly. It's it's making itself a meme coin. It's it's trying to to ride those uh, trader cycles as opposed to actually delivering results. And if they're not delivering, there's a reason why they're not. So um, anyhow, I posted this thread, and uh, to my surprise, a bunch of people got offended, and uh, and and people got offended that I didn't I didn't even have in mind at all. So then I had to post this um, update that says. A secondary purpose of this thread is to serve as a honeypot to see which teams will uh, will get upset and uh, and uh, betray that their technology does not work. So um, it, I didn't name anybody in what I said. I don't know who who will take it upon themselves. I don't mean to identify anybody or target anybody. I want to identify a common pattern. If you find Avalanche constantly promising something that is not being delivered, then uh, you can definitely play my video back to me and make fun of me, and that's totally fine. Um, but uh, but in uh, you know I think I'm proud of the the uh, the delivery that we have done in the in the 14 months that the system has been up. I'm supremely proud of the growth that we've seen. We've had gro uh, hockey stick growth, and uh, supremely proud of the fact that I lost count of how many actual projects are deployed. It's many 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 hundreds, more than 500, probably probably less than thousand, but more than 500 high quality. Uh, smart contract dApps deployed on top of Avalanche today. I, I can't keep track. There used to be a very nice picture of uh, all the logos, and it was pretty sparsely populated. And then it got denser and denser and denser. And now I just go like, there is. I need some kind of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, magnifying glass to really see what's going on here. It's it's become really hard to follow. So I'm really proud of that. And um, and so you should look for, you know, whether or not you're in a waiting for Godot situation. And don't be in a waiting for Godot situation. Godot will not arrive more than likely. Okay, so uh, other things going on. Um, we ended up getting great coverage uh, around the New York City mayor, Eric Adams. Um, and uh, we uh, this was uh, featured on Reuters. I think this is like this is syndicated around around the nation for sure, and also around the world. And um, uh, Ava Labs is one of the premier companies. We're probably one of the biggest. We might be the biggest blockchain company in New York City. Um, that uh, came down to New York City for the explicit purpose of bringing blockchain technologies to Wall Street to finance and to revitalizing the finance infrastructure around the world. And um, we identified Eric Adams early on, and uh, we're talking to the mayor's office to see what we can do with them. Uh, and I'm really thrilled about that cooperation. And that goes on the heels of another cooperation that we had. This is uh, Ava Labs president, John Wu, and uh, uh, he is masked on the left. And on the right is the Miami mayor, Francis Suarez. And um, Mayor Suarez and, and John had a, a, a fantastic discussion. And uh, we also have a satellite branch in Florida, in Miami, thanks to uh, Mayor Suarez's presence there and his, his encouragement for us to move down there. And um, it's, uh, it's happening. Crypto adoption will happen. And I'm talking to, I've talked to a fair number of people uh, in cities around the world that are trying to deploy blockchain technologies for government purposes. So um, let's see, what else happened? Celsius came to Avalanche. Um, this is a, a fantastic opportunity to get high uh, yields. Um, I, know, I know the kinds of yields I'm getting from my bank and uh, approximately zero. And uh, uh, you know, the bank seems like uh, it's, just, it's just a big source of hassles really. Um, and, uh, uh, and what Celsius does, it allows you to get, uh, to get returns on your, on your, um, on your uh, uh, um, collateral and uh, it allows you to borrow against your collateral. So if what one thing you can do with a landing platform like Celsius is, is if you have some tokens, let's say you have some Avox, that you believe in the long-term future of, but you don't want to sell and you have some immediate cash need, well, you can convert, you can borrow against your collateral um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and satisfy the cash need uh, without selling your tokens. It's an interesting idea. My bank offers this service and... Um, I'm sure it's a huge hassle, but uh, it's fairly straightforward to do uh, online on the C-chain uh, with a couple of clicks in MetaMask. Always, of course, trade responsibly, et cetera, et cetera. The standard, uh, standard things apply. Don't, uh, don't risk anything you cannot lose. Obviously, if the, if the price goes down and your collateral is not sufficient to cover the amount you borrowed, then there will be liquidations and so on. Okay. Um, so this uh, this was a funny tweet from Kevin. Um, 
So, uh, so, or maybe maybe the funny part was added by me, but uh, Kevin's tweet was not funny. It just simply shows the uh, the trajectory uh, of uh, fee burning on Avalanche. So remember again that um, in Avalanche, all fees are burned. They're not given to the miners. They don't recirculate into the system. They disappear. It's as if collectively the Avalanche network has a product and um, the users are consuming that product and they literally have to burn it, consume it, make it disappear uh, to get their work done. And thus, as a result, we're all getting, uh, uh, getting some value because the coins that, that aren't consumed are becoming scarcer and scarcer. This growth is amazing. I think that's any kind of a, so, uh, you know, imagine the, the Avalanche network as a baby or any, as a, as a company, anyone sitting on it, this kind of growth would be, would be, would be very pleased. So here we're looking at the C chain fees that are burned and the growth is amazing. You can extrapolate from those, uh, those, those lines any which way you like. Um, and, uh, and of course, the rate at which the coins are burned is in excess of, uh, not of course, but it's great to see that the rate at which the fees are, are, uh, are being burned is going to be in excess of uh, uh, the rate at which the coins are being generated. So um, there was this whole discussion about sound money, um, hyper sound money, etc. cetera. So, uh, so now I think the next phrase to coin is mega hyper sound money. Avox is mega hyper sound money. Um, everybody's saying these meaningless things and if we're gonna jump on a, on a marketing trend uh, here, well, we, we made one up. Um, but the bottom line is it's really nice to see these fees burn. Um, it's even nicer that the individual fees paid by any individual are tiny. It's just that in aggregate on a high capacity chain, you can burn a heck of a lot of coin. And that's a wonderful situation to be in. People are paying a small amount each, so a lot it's affordable, a lot of people can use it. But in aggregate, there's a lot of uh, coins being burned, which is great for everybody else. And, um, and the network is capable, that's because the network is capable of high capacity uh, transactions. So more on the, okay, so now I couldn't really stick through to my, uh, my, uh, my key phrase here. So I, I apparently it's hyper mega sound is what I also, I never know which one of these is, is gonna stick better. Let's make it mega hyper sound. So another instance of mega hyper sound money is uh, this projection from Luigi that looks at when exactly the, the, the burn is going to exceed uh, the mint. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's looking great, uh, at least on this projection. And uh, we'll see what happens. I suspect, you know, this is a hockey stick and we're only in the initial months of the hockey stick growth. Uh, we'll see how, uh, uh, how much faster it grows. So there's a, there's a good chance that these things will be outdated. All right, so, um, oh, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, this is the number of monthly active addressees in the first week of January. And, uh, and the number in the very first week of this month is higher than the whole month of October. So we're 4Xing the number of active users on chain since October. So it's November, December. So in, within two months, uh, the number of users 4Xed. And uh, this is happening without any kind of an incentive program. We did absolutely nothing to give any kind of an incentive to anybody to create a new address. We didn't do this. There are chains out there who raised money and uh, some of the money that they raised was locked and, uh, and it would only be unlocked if they had a certain level of activity. So those people then did all sorts of funky things like airdrops and uh, uh, whatever else that they do to, uh, to trigger the condition that would release the money to themselves. That's not the case here. We had absolutely zero mind, zero attention paid to this area. And, um, and uh, it's just, this is the organic growth that we're seeing. And I'm thrilled about this. This is great. And I hope, I hope that this will continue uh, up until the point where we saturate at least the current set of people who know how to use blockchains. And, um, and I also plan to, to make it so easy for normal people to access blockchains without even realizing they're accessing it, that uh, we'll also be able to attract um, regular people who are not crypto savvy. So uh, um, if, if you've ever played with the C-Chain uh, or if you've ever played with Avalanche, you know that you can. it's so fast that people can interact with it thinking that they're interacting with a web service, with a centralized service. So that's one of the things, key things in our arsenal. Um, these other chains where the block times are, or, you know, finalization times are five seconds, 15 seconds, 
37 minutes, you know, an hour or more. They cannot do this. It's inaccessible to them. But we can do it because we have sub-second finality. And, uh, and I, I'm so thrilled about this situation. OK, um, we had a big announcement um, at uh, CES in Las Vegas. Um, I couldn't go, um, but uh, uh, you know, for a bunch of reasons, it was, it was the height of COVID, and Las Vegas is not, not my gig. But, uh, um, but uh, the car maker TOG, T-O-G-G, announced that they would be uh, building the, the future, uh, a future mobility platform with, the, the, with Avalanche at its core. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about TOG. This is an interesting smart car company um, based in Istanbul, in Turkey. Uh, they plan to serve a nation of about 80 million people. And um, so, you know, I know you've seen announcements like this. I know you've seen announcements where you know, a blockchain group, a project says, hey, we're going to work with fancy company, some company you've heard of. And, um, and what they really mean is they spoke to some people at the innovation office at that company. And people at the innovation office were tasked by their CEO to work with a blockchain. So there was a, you know, there were a couple of people in the company and a couple of people at the project and they're going to do something. It's going to be a proof of concept. It's going to go nowhere. So this is not that. This is the production crew. This is TOG as a company. It's the CEO of the company on the other side of this saying, we're going to build this. And, um, and it's going to be in every car we build. And I want to say a few words about why this is so incredibly cool. So, you know, we've seen you know, autonomous cars. We've seen smart vehicles. You guys have seen Kit from Knight Rider. When I was a kid, it was really cool with its uh, lights going back and forth. Now you've seen the flying things from the Jetsons, of course. So the world is going towards that, that vision. Um, the world is going towards that vision uh, you know, in the hands of just a handful of players. There aren't that many players that are building these things. So TOG is a new entrant here. And, um, and the thing about TOG that's exciting or interesting is the fact that they're treating a whole lot of the car as a commodity. I think it's pretty clear by now that, uh, that um, you know, batteries are a commodity technology. Right. Can you get an edge by building great battery technology? Sure, I'm sure Tesla is going to be exploring that. Uh, but will you be able to buy the stuff in bulk um, and, and do fairly well just buying it? Yes, that's, I think, also the case. So um, electric motors, they're being built by experts who specialize on electric motors. And the car companies are essentially uh, assembling larger and larger components. The same way software industry has changed. We used to write code from scratch all across the board for any application. Now we glue bigger and bigger components. So where is value created in a universe where we're playing with bigger and bigger components? It's typically in the software. It's typically at the very last uh, layer that is user facing. And that's the, uh, the mobility layer. And into that mobility layer, uh, we're going to be integrating the Avalanche wallet and the Avalanche SDK. Every single car will come with this. And every single car will be capable of issuing payments. It will be capable of holding credentials. It will be capable of checking the, uh, the supply chain uh, validity of every component that's being mounted or placed into the car. And uh, there are many other uses that you can do if you can assume that every vehicle on the road, or not every, but certain vehicles on the road, um, have the ability to, uh, to have cryptographically secure communication. So this is a wonderful situation to be in, and I'm thrilled about this, uh, this partnership. Um, you know, I saw all the, all the videos of various prototype cars uh, built by TOG, you know, being tested. The, the crash dummy tests are always fantastic to watch. Uh, a couple of us... Uh, at, at Ava Labs, I wasn't one of them, but uh, a few of my my, my folks uh, ended up going to the company and seeing the the production uh, facilities in place. So it's been it's been a lot of fun, and uh, and to think that every single one of those cars will also come with an Avalanche wallet, and you'll be able to zip through you know tunnels, bridges, payment systems, etc. You'll be able to communicate with uh, with uh, with mechanics uh, devices, etc. It's just a fantastic different universe, and. Um, and not very far away from, from, uh, from where we are today. Um, so let's see. Okay, so as I said, innovation has always been driven so by software and um, uh, it's, 
uh, this work is going to open up a lot of new areas for us and also for for generally for blockchains. Okay, um, oh, this was really cool last week. This was the metaverse. It's a, it's, a, it's a sign of the metaverse. I don't know why this little video is not playing. Uh, there's a video here that should be playing. Uh, maybe it's because I'm not doing the view thing properly. Um, let's see this. Is that going to show? Maybe. Oop, maybe not. Okay. Well, in any case, um, this is um, this is a video of a game uh, where you uh, you buy these uh, Peng NFTs on on Kalao, and um, you can do things with the Pengs that you have. So it's a very simple integration of NFTs and gaming. And uh, I want to give you the high level view of what to expect. So there are a couple of things you should be able to immediately recognize, and, and they they point to certain trends. This is a two D game. That's one of the first things you should be able to see. It's kind of like a retro game. I kind of love these myself. Um, the thing about 2D games is that they are easy to build, relatively speaking. If you talk to gaming companies, um, they will tell you that it takes about two to four years for a modern three-dimensional game to be drawn. The artistry required, the expertise required, the rendering required takes time. So 2D games are not like that. The board games that I also happen to love are not like that. They are... They, they focus on a different area, and then the art the artwork required is a lot simpler, and uh, they can be built quickly. So this is why you're going to see a whole bunch of games like this initially. Rest assured that there's far more coming, and rest assured that um, this is going to be an exciting journey. There will be a bunch of gaming companies that don't see the value of blockchainifying their games, their offerings. Uh, the incumbents, the big ones, they already command much of the market and they will see blockchains as a distraction, uh, maybe even a threat, and they will stay away from them. But blockchains, as you know, can be a great equalizer and a great way for, uh, for investments in one game to be carried over from one to the other, for ecosystems to be built across multiple games. And um, the savvy companies will see this and uh, we'll see some great uses of it. You know, maybe it starts in the form of a little peng, I think it's a penguin, uh, that travels around in a 2D universe. And um, and then we find ourselves in a completely different metaverse 10 years from now. And it starts in small uh, steps like this. So, um, okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's that. Um, there's also uh, this uh, development from GMX. This is a, uh, a leveraged uh, trading tool. I'm not a big fan of people using leverage. It can, they can lose a lot of money very, very quickly. Um, but, uh, but if you do want to use it, well, then there's GMX that just came online. Um, it's on Avalanche. It's really smooth to use, and it's kind of fun. So if you're into this kind of stuff, do check it out. It's kind of neat. Um, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, so uh, so this, was, this was a tweet I sent out in response to the micro bear market. You know, this, we had a micro bear market, I think, in November. Everybody got freaked out. All the trader accounts were like, "Oh, is this this is the beginning of a bear market?" Blah blah blah, and it was all it was all for nothing. It it just it just recovered from there. Um, and uh, we had another one, uh, I think, last week. Uh, again, like things went down a little bit, and everyone's like, "Oh, you know, whatever." And you know, why did it go down? These are all questions I get. There's a very simple answer to this. And now that we're in New York City and we talk a lot to to these institutional players here, there's a very simple reason. When the equities market goes down, then uh, these institutions that did come into crypto, they have portfolios and they have to post more collateral. And their crypto, crypto side of their portfolio did incredibly well. So they sell some of it to cover their losses in the equities market. And that's what links equities and crypto. Crypto should be decoupled from equities, you would think. But because they're held in by the same people, they get linked, assets become linked uh, by uh, by institutions, by people with big pockets holding a, a pair of the same asset together and, and making investment decisions in tandem for the two. So that's what was going on. And so they will do that balancing and, you know, prices will go up and down. And, um, and it doesn't matter because behind the scenes, there is a, a, a fantastic thing going on. What is that fantastic thing? People are inventing new assets. And uh, one of them was ILOs. And um, was covered in, uh, I think Vice uh, covered this. 
There's a company called Rival that's being formed. And uh, the idea is to, uh, to do initial litigation offerings. The idea is to democratize um, litigation finance. So if somebody has some kind of a legal quarrel with someone and wants to sue to get what's, what's rightfully theirs, but doesn't have the resources to do it, they can finance it um, using, uh, using blockchains and tokens. And uh, the legal groundwork for this has been done by Roche Friedman and, and others. So it's an idea that came out of uh, some people at Ava Labs uh, and uh, was taken to, to its conclusion, was executed upon by Roche and Republic. Um, and the very first ILO just happened, uh, just concluded and was oversubscribed uh, about uh, 10 days ago. And um, I expect many more ILOs to come. I'm really thrilled. This is an area that's about, I think, $10 billion uh, at the moment, maybe 20, 10 to 20, I think it is. It's projected to grow far more. Um, it's a fantastic area and um, really, really interesting area. And, um, and I'm, I'm thrilled about what's going to happen here. It's that, you know, that much interest being you know, that much value on a blockchain is great to have. And uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, and also, you know, a side effect of this is people are going to be able to more, uh, more easily find funding for, um, uh, for uh, financing their uh, litigation. Okay. And uh, then there is this whole discussion about, um, about layer twos, about other layer ones. And um, I don't want to pick on anybody here, but it was triggered by uh, Kobe um, talking about DEXs on other systems where the DEX might take days to process an order. And this is a good time to, to, to take a look at uh, DEXalot. Um, DEXalot processes an order in 740 milliseconds. Just two blinks of the eye, it's done, it's finalized. So none of this like takes days. None of this like, you know, exit process that takes uh, multiple days, etc. It's just you do your transaction, you are done. It's a flat world. It's an easy access world. It's a democratic world. It's open. It's fast. If you build it right, then it's, uh, it's smooth and, and fantastic. And once again, you know, um, let me reiterate. There's a lot of talk about L1s and L2s and, you know, all sorts of fancy words being thrown around, etc but it's just a universe of blockchains connected by bridges. That's all it is. It doesn't matter if, if you, you know, somebody's calling themselves an L2, other people are calling themselves L1s. The, the differences are, are really, really esoteric and, and minute. In many cases, impossible to really point to. Nobody has a, a proper definition. I still, to this day, I do not know what a side chain is. And many L2s are side chains. So, but there's no working definition. There's a whole paper on side chains um, it's formatted as if it's an academic paper. It doesn't contain a definition for what the heck it is. And there's a very good rebuttal to that paper that says, is uh, uh, Jorge's uh, couch, Jorge is a uh, professor in Brazil, is Jorge's couch a, a side chain? And he goes through the arguments and, and argues, given the definitions in this paper, my couch fits the definition of a side chain. So these differences are minute avoid the temptation to get into nerdy battles of like naming things and etc cetera, etc cetera. you've just got chains that's all you've got and various technologies for moving assets around that we call bridges they're good bridges they're really crappy bridges and uh, in some of the cases these bridges can be incredibly slow and uh, or incredibly insecure so but the right model, I think I was the very first person to say this, and, and I'm now beginning to see the world slowly understand that this is exactly the right way to view it, is that there are chains and then there are bridges. And, um, and many chains are absolutely unusable. They're utterly worthless. And I mentioned some of them at the beginning of the, of the discussion. People will get excited about them. You know, Lucky will show up and will give you some gobbledygook. Godot isn't here yet for this, for this particular chain, but you know, he will arrive and when he does, it's gonna be great because, and then he mentions a, a bunch of crypto gobbledygook. Um, but you should just look at what it does today and how it's connected to other chains, okay? So L2s, how are they connected to their L1s? L1s, how easy is it to move assets around? And then, then form an opinion on whether this thing is waiting for Godot or it's a real tech. So uh, this is Dexalot. You can check it out right now. And uh, every transaction does take 740 milliseconds on the chain. Um, it's a little slower if you use MetaMask. Let me, let me mention that because of MetaMask reasons, but not because of the underlying chain. 
So, uh, oh yeah, on the same topic of optimistic roll-ups, these were the talk of the town. We everybody was waiting for them to come up, right? This is uh, this is the big thing, and um, remember, the big thing often changes. Lucky every day he shows up in that in that play, he he says a different set of gobbledygook. So for a while, it was optimistic roll-ups will save the day, and you know some people uh, ended up saying, hey, you know, there's a data availability issue with optimistic roll-ups, and you know, they started raising the, some of the obvious questions that I think we've discussed before on this podcast. So um, in any case, uh, so here's Ryan Sean Adams. He's an ETH maxi. He's saying, was anyone able to successfully withdraw tokens back to Ethereum uh, when Arbitrum went down recently? And it turns out, no, there's a seven-day withdrawal challenge window with optimistic rollups. So that's the, that's the tech there. Um, and uh, so when Godot does arrive, you know, he's, he's, you end up seeing seeing him as a flawed person, like every one of us, and um, and uh, and and so it's not as shiny anymore. But if it doesn't arrive, it can be very very smooth. So um, anyhow, um, this uh, on on that topic, then maybe let's conclude. I'm really excited about the year to come. There will be a lot of new technologies introduced by Ava Labs. There will be a lot of a lot of technologies that we are working on that are uh, coming to fruition that haven't seen the light of day yet. I'm really excited about that. I'm also seeing huge signs from large players that um, they are thrilled about the crypto space and um, they're growing their investment in it. They have seen other people uh, do really well by getting in early into the crypto space uh, in years prior. So I'm excited. And um, the thing that gets me most excited, of course, is seeing new stuff done with blockchains. And um, and uh, this year is going to be a year of, as I said, battles of bridges. Uh, we're going to see more of that. Uh, we're going to see um, some really exciting new developments in terms of taking the technologies, the smart contract DeFi technologies we've developed and making it accessible to a larger audience. And um, it should be incredibly fun and, uh, uh, and, a, and, and you know, and, and an exciting journey. And so I'm excited. Um, and with that, I think that's the end of my podcast this week. I'm really re very much looking forward to this weekend. It's a three day weekend in the US and uh, I hope you all spend uh, some time with your loved ones. And um, hope uh, everybody around the globe is having a great time in the middle of a very cold winter here in New York. Um, and uh, hope to talk to you in a week. I'll see where we are then. Take care.